Hey, how's it going? I'm Isla Golden and welcome to Isla Reads. There it was again, that distinct rustling noise which had followed her since her teens. She still had no idea who or what was making it, but some instinct told her it had something to do with a strangely blurred figure she'd seen the day her final conversion therapy had failed. In the same breath, her heart would flutter with excitement and fall hard with disappointment. It didn't matter how eagerly she tried to spot them or how desperately she wanted them to just be there, they always remained out of sight. It pained her to think it was all in her head, that her saviour might not really exist, but until she could prove otherwise, all she really had was lonely faith. Still, she had no time to dwell, not with Synth making a beeline race towards her. His eagerness to get to her at the end of school day always made Echo smile, as though this were proof her son really loved her. Without hesitation, she pulled him up onto her lap for a big hug and listened to him babble on about his day. As he did, her eyes turned back towards the school building. Piccolo was one of the last out, as usual, dragging her feet and checking her reflection in every single shiny surface she passed. Echo had never met a nine-year-old quite as vain as her daughter, a trait which had only escalated since Cleo had entered their lives. In front of one of the school's shiny wall mosaics, Piccolo stopped, lifted her knee-length hair into a shorter position and used the end of it to form a kind of makeshift fringe. Piccolo's hair was closer in colour to Echo's own rich auburn, which she usually wore shoulder length for convenience. But unlike Echo, Piccolo's hair was almost woven through with naturally blonde highlights. Everyone always commented on just how beautiful, she, beautiful it was, which only encouraged her vanity. I'm thinking about getting my hair cut shorter, Piccolo announced when she finally reached them. I know, we've discussed it before, remember? Echo did her best not to roll her eyes. Your patch and I have both told you it's your hair and you're free to do with it as you wish. I know, but she hesitated for a moment. I do like fairies are supposed to have long hair. I wouldn't be a proper angelic fairy if I got it all cut off. You're part niece nymph too, you know. Echo tried not to sound too impatient at her daughter's frequently made statement. Besides, you don't have to get it all cut off. We could just bring the ends of it to the middle of your back. Get that fringe you want cut, cut in, maybe. Maybe, she pressed her lips together for a long moment. Maybe I could ask Cleo about it. She knows lots about this kind of thing. Well, she is a hairdresser, Pico. I would be surprised if she didn't. Once again, Echo did her best to mask her displeasure. You'll be seeing her tomorrow. You can ask her about it then. With Synth still firmly on her lap, Echo manoeuvred her chair around and began making her way out of the school grounds. Get off Murmur's lap, squirt. Pico half glared at her brother. You're too heavy to ride with her anymore. I'm not. Ah, uh, too. Pico, I can manage. She shot her daughter a look. And it would be nice if you could stop all these needless arguments with your brother. Piccolo rolled her eyes and said nothing. Gritting her teeth, Echo did her best not to say anything which might turn the momentary preteen strop into a full-blown argument. Her daughter's attitude had started around the same time Nia had moved out, and Echo wasn't sure if it was an indication Piccolo was going to be an early bloomer or a reaction to the breakup of her family unit. Either way, Echo got the feeling Piccolo blamed her for whatever insecurities she was feeling, because, according to Cleo, she was always first out whenever they went to pick her up. Mama, look! Synth pointed to something and Echo did her best to see what it was. Yes, darling, I can see. It's a very nice tree, big and strong. Not, no, not tree. Look! It's probably just a squirrel again, Mama. Piccolo rolled her eyes. And it's probably difficult for Mama to see anything behind her right now, Squirt. It's okay, we can stop and see what it is, right, Synth? Echo slowed her chair down and carefully turned back towards the tree. It's not like we're in a rush to get home. Well, I'm in a rush. Piccolo folded her arms and kept walking. And I don't want to waste my time staring at some dumb old squirrel. Piccolo, we've talked about this before. You're too young to walk home on your own, Echo warned. So you will wait patiently. Do you understand? Only that you said absolutely nothing about me not being able to fly home by myself. With two swooping flaps of her delicate wings, she was up in the air. Piccolo, Mary, Mayfeather, you come back here right this instant. Echo gritted her teeth once more, a 
as she turned her chair back around and began moving after her daughter. Unfortunately for her, Piccolo had always been a strong, fast flyer, and even before she'd started following, her daughter was already half a street away. In her lap, Synth made noises of protest as she did her best to pick up speed and catch up to her daughter. But her haste meant she failed to pay attention to where she was until the screeching sound of brakes rang out close to her ears. She turned in the direction of the noise, just in time to see a web of earth, vines and moss form a protective barrier between her and the shiny red sports car. There was a loud thunk from the barrier as the car met with it, and in shock, Echo allowed herself to roll to a stop. Instantly, the driver was out of his car, examining the damage. He was a toweringly tall Wolfian, whose dark grey fur was visibly bristling with anger as his wolf-like eyes turned on Echo, and he stormed towards her. Are you stupid or something? He virtually growled each word. What kind of idiot crosses a road without looking? You're just lucky that Gera Webb of yours didn't damage my car, lady. I, I didn't, I mean, it's not my web. I can't use Gera. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Just take it down so I can get out of here already. And maybe you should take one of your kids' road safety classes so you don't endanger any more innocent people. I'd hardly call you innocent. Cleo appeared, almost out of nowhere. You are racing towards that pedestrian crossing, she indicated towards the street, like it was some kind of finishing line. This is a school zone. If anyone's in the wrong here, it's you. I, the driver blinked at her for a moment. You're lucky we're not calling the police, really. She didn't let him get another word out. From what I've heard, they've been having a lot of trouble with reckless drivers around here recently, and are just dying to make an example out of someone. Are you threatening me? His wolf-like ears twitched as though they were trying hard not to flatten. I wouldn't call it a threat exactly, she shot him an oh-so-fake smile. But if I were you, I would take advantage of the fact the barrier has dis finally disappeared. She wrinkled her nose and wriggled her fingers at him. Bye-bye. Without saying another word, the driver headed back towards his car with his tail between his legs. Echo had to admit she was impressed. Wolfians towered over most other breeds, making them visually imposing, and to someone who hadn't met many before now, completely intimidating. But Cleo had talked that one down as though it was something she did every single day of her life. As though she somehow knew, beneath all that anger and fur that was just another coward and willing to call her bluff. It may automatically made her wonder what experiences the Fire Pixie had had in her life to lead her to such a point. Then, almost instantly, she shook those thoughts away. Cleo and her weren't supposed to bond and become friends. That wasn't how it worked. Thanks. Echo shot Cleo a sheepish look. But he's right. I wasn't looking where I was going. I was in the wrong too. That doesn't mean he can get on his high horse about it, though. You had right of way. Besides, she glanced towards a pale-faced piccolo. You had more reason to be speeding than he did. Piccolo edged closer to Echo, but remained completely silent. It was pretty clear from the expression on her face she knew what had just happened was probably her fault. For now, at least, it felt like more than enough punishment for running off. Here, let me walk you home so you don't get into any more trouble. Cleo took hold of the handles of Echo's chair and began pushing her along. Oh, no, you really don't need to, she tried to protest. I can manage just fine on my own. Oh, don't be silly. You've just had a pretty big fright there, and Nia would never forgive me if I didn't see you safely home. Besides, I'm walking this way anyway, and we wouldn't want anyone telling Nia I was being unsociable. And there it was, the tiny little dig needed to make things between them awkward and tense again. This was how things were. Civil up until the point one of them made some kind of unneeded and unwanted jab at the other, and then tension. So... Echo did her best to pretend things weren't as tense as they were. Did you have the day off or, uh, I had an um, appointment in the area. Oh, I didn't know your style made house calls. They don't. It was personal. I see. How was your day? The question was so forced you could almost hear the claw marks as it fought to remain unasked. Uneventful. Echo shot her a tense smile. If Claire wasn't going to share any details of her day, why should she? You mean, apart from the little running with the car just now? Echo went to answer, but before she did, she thought she spotted someone in the street ahead of them, 
a tracker fairy, a mousy, somewhat familiar looking tracker fairy. She blinked, narrowed her gaze, doing her best to focus on them, on her. But before she could be certain it was who she thought it was, they'd disappeared. Echo? Cleo brought her chair to a halt and peered down at her with something resembling concern. Are you sure you're all right? I, I'm fine. She shook her head and forced a smile. I just thought I saw someone I know, that's all. Are you sure? Honestly, I'm sure that I'm okay. She nodded as her eyes began to search the street ahead of them again. I'm also sure I want to get home. All right, if you're sure. Cleo began pushing her forward again. I am. For a moment, there was silence between them again. Then Echo gave an edgy cough, wishing what she knew she had to say next came more naturally. Or at least more naturally when it came to saying it to her. I know I've already said it once, but thank you, Cleo. To her relief, the words sounded genuine enough. I'm not sure what I would have done if you hadn't shown up when you had. I'm sure you would have managed somehow. There was something similarly genuine about Cleo's tone. Because that's what you do, isn't it, Echo? You always find a way. It had been two days since the audition, two days since the car incident, and both are still playing heavily on Echo's mind. She found herself in a strange muddle of emotions, excited for the future and worried about the present. As if to deal with it, in quiet moments like this one, she found herself watching the trees at the far end of her back garden. Where had the protective barrier come from? It was the most prominent thought circling her mind and would continue to be until she found a definite answer for it. She wasn't a Gary user and neither was Mir, so it wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense if Piccolo or Synth could use that elemental. But just because it was unlikely didn't mean it was impossible. After all, there are plenty of recessive powers in all the enchanted breeds. But even if they were capable, Piccolo had been too far away and it was much too strong and precise a barrier for someone of Synth's age to pull off instinctively. So it had to be someone else. A mousy little tracker fairy following her for some unknown reason, perhaps. But if it was, if it really had been Twigs she'd seen that day, why hadn't she stepped forward to at least check if everyone was all right? No one could really be so shy, could they? As she was wondering about this, she noticed movement in the trees she was absolutely watching. At first she thought it was a small animal or the wind, until her mind realised the movement wasn't so much in the trees as it was around the trunks. Curiously, she rolled herself out of the house and onto the small bit of patio connecting the house to a paved path through the garden. The movement looked even weirder now she didn't have any glass between her and it. It was like a strange shimmering or something. Almost needing to know what it was, she made her way towards the path. But the second her wheels touched it, whatever it was disappeared. Sighing heavily, she told herself she was just imagining things and made her way back into the house. Once inside, she found herself glancing up at the large daisy clock on the wall opposite the sink. Instantly, her heart lurched with panic. She'd been so engrossed in her own thoughts, she'd pretty much lost track of the afternoon. And if she didn't leave right now, she'd be late picking up the kids. Groaning with a strange kind of self-disappointment, she gathered everything she needed, locked up and set out. She made it to the gates just as the kids started pouring out of the building. Sighing in relief, she glanced around for Synth and was surprised to find he wasn't amongst the first to leave. It, was, it wasn't that unusual. Miss Fairchild, who'd also been Piccolo's teacher when she'd first started school, occasionally got a little overly engrossed in a book she was reading to the class during story time. The kids loved it, not one of them really noticing the overrun until someone's parent came knocking on the classroom door, wondering, where their child, wondering why their child hadn't come out yet. Since Piccolo had started dragging her feet, Echo hadn't been that parent. But when her daughter appeared and Synth still wasn't in sight, she found herself making her way towards the building. Miss Fairchild says she wants to see you, Piccolo shrugged in way of greeting. I think she still has Synth in there with her. She was smart enough not to trust him with the message. Picco, she half scolded as she made her way into the school building. I didn't mean he wouldn't tell you on purpose, she rolled her eyes as she followed. I just mean he'd probably forget. He always forgets everything. Piccolo. There was more of a scolding tone in her voice now. He's only five. The things he forgets, he probably hasn't processed as being important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
By this time, they'd made it for Miss Fairchild's classroom. Echo knocked on the door before opening it and manoeuvring her chair through and into the room. Synth was sat at his desk, colouring, almost oblivious to the fact everyone else had left. But the second he spotted Echo, a huge smile spread across his face, making him forget all about his colouring and race towards her. Hey there, my little one, she scooped him up into her hug. Are you okay? Uh-huh, he nodded. Piccolo, would you mind entertaining your brother for a little while whilst I speak to your murmur, please? Miss Fairchild's soft but firm voice brought Echo's attention towards the broad-shouldered urban pixie. Yes, Miss Fairchild, Piccolo took hold of Synth's arm and half dragged him off of Echo's lap. Come on, Squirt, let's go play in the sandpit. Once they were out of the way, Echo rolled her chair across the room towards Miss Fairchild's desk. Her eyes locked curiously but firmly with the aging teacher. Has something happened? That's what I was hoping you could tell me. Miss Fairchild pushed a piece of paper towards her. Glancing down, Echo wasn't quite sure what to think or feel about what she was seeing. It was obviously one of Synth's drawings, not because his style was particularly unique for his age, but because it contained the tree man. All his pictures always contained the tree man, usually somewhere in the background, drawn as a stick man with a tail and no face, stood in front of a tree. The picture itself had her in it, with Synth sitting on her lap and Piccolo flying just ahead of them. The piccolo in his picture had an angry scowl on her face and it was clear she and Synth were chasing after her. Behind them was a large green wall with an angry wolf in a red car. There was no doubt in Echo's mind this was the incident from Monday, an incident that she tried to come up with an explanation for it without sounding like a bad murmur. I know we've talked at length before about Synth's imaginary friend. Miss Fairchild gave a slight cough. As she brought Echo's attention back to, up towards her. The tree man? Echo frowned. This is about the tree man. This is about the fact your son still isn't socialising well with the other children, she sighed. This isn't like Piccolo's wiggly man, wobbly man, Echo corrected. Yes, well, as I was saying, this isn't like with Piccolo's imaginary friend, who phased out as she started playing more and more with the other kids, because, well, your son won't play with them but I never see him talking to the tree man either. Kids with imaginary friends usually talk and interact with them, but if it wasn't for the fact that since draws him constantly, we wouldn't even know he existed. Piccolo was the same with the wobbly man, and my sister was with Tiggy. Echo felt herself becoming more defensive. Not all kids talk to their imaginary friends in the way we expect them to. I can't speak for your sister, obviously, but we both know Icarus wings can come with some other issues. And since Piccolo's ability to play with the other children eventually allowed her to leave her imaginary friend behind. I know what you're trying to imply, Miss Fairchild, but all we really know right now is that Synth is a little introverted. So is his uncle, and it never hurt him any. And before you ask, yes, his uncle also has Icarus wings, so I do know what I'm talking about here. That may be so, Miss Sweet Charm, but I fear the longer we put off testing him, the more we're going to end up hindering his social development. And this imaginary friend business really doesn't help. The tree man used to be a small background feature in his drawings. But look, she pointed towards the picture. Not only is he in the foreground, he's actually interacting with the scene. She had to admit it did look as though the tree man was the one creating the barrier between her chair and the car. She hadn't wanted to acknowledge it originally because she wasn't sure how she felt about the idea. But she couldn't deny that's what the picture was trying to tell her. Look, Miss Fairchild sighed again. You're not the first parent, nor will you be the last I have to talk to about their quiet child becoming more withdrawn. And I know you want to hold off testing him for as long as possible. But can you please at least meet me halfway here and try him out with some after school clubs and activities? Introverted personalities, especially ones with Icarus wings, can find it hard to find common ground with other children in a school environment. Sometimes it's because they feel intimidated other times it's because they just don't know where to start. Socialising with others who have a common interest can give them somewhere to start. Here, she pulled out several leaflets. These are all the local clubhouses in the area for kids between the ages of 3 and 12. They all do arts and craft groups and since arts and crafts is the only time he even attempts to talk to any of the others, I thought it would be a good place for him to start. And who knows, 
Making a few friends at one of these clubs might give him the confidence he needs to start making friends in school too. I know you probably think I'm blowing this all out of proportion just because of his condition, but believe me, Miss Sweet Charm, I only have his best interests at heart. Enjoyed what you've heard so far? Please consider subscribing to find out when the next part's being released. Thanks for watching. See ya!